The driving idea behind the production of Charge was uh, to create a tribute to those very cool and exciting AAA game cinematics and to play with the idea of real-time interactive visualization of, uh, of content. So how can we tell a story that has that look and it has that vibe that is very unique, very specific of that kind of media with Blender? This was the first time that we were doing a realistic looking character. It might be like what we call it, this heightened realism, but it's still very different from the previous stuff that I've worked on. We were going in it uh, relatively blind. The biggest learning experience comes from the fact that we've never done something that is aiming at cinematic heightened realism, maybe like a game trailer-esque thing. It's comparable to the Agent Barbershop and Similar to Spring, it's quite fast-paced editing, so there's a lot of shots, and every shot means that it's like a different lighting cue for every shot. In a dystopia uh, of energy scarcity and all destitute man uh, needs to break into an energy factory to get a fresh battery, but finds himself st stuck inside with the alarms going off and a droid coming at him and no way out. Andy came up with the idea that well, what if this just takes place in Iceland because there's a lot of geothermal energy there and this is a dystopia where it's been so polluted that you can't rely on getting solar energy. And there's this kind of uh, disconnect between the rich and the poor. So what you're left with is that geothermal energy becomes like really valuable. And then of course you have to make commodities out of it, like some package it in some way to sell it. So these are actual geothermal plants, which are some inspiration for, you know, piping and how the machinery works. Brutalist architecture, which is also a part of the whole design aesthetic. I mainly modeled a lot of assets and the idea was this guard should have eyes everywhere and the guard itself is actually like someone who's just hired there, like he just sits up there and reads while designing some stuff for him to read, we just came to the idea to just add Bowie, which is uh, Tom's dog, of course, so, uh, to add him on the cover. The main reference for the design of the character was photo-based, or actual human beings that exist. For that, we did look at a lot of references of older men. Also, since there was less concept art available this time, a lot more happened in sculpting. The biggest challenge, or one of the biggest challenges that I think we all um, solved together was uh, Einar's facial rigging. So, Julian here behind me did a lot of work on um, sculpting the expressions by hand, and then we had to integrate those expressions into the rig, and then I had to hook the, the sculpts and the wrinkles uh, to the rig. Um, and all the activations. Like, iterating on this was quite difficult because like a lot of things had to be redone to make small tweaks. We were trying to put a lot of different uh, elements of the face into a single displacement map. I think the main challenge of the retopology is for Einar specifically that the sculpting still happened at the same time and it had, it had to happen on the final retopology. That was a problem in a couple of moments where we needed to update the retopology and updating anything in the topology itself basically broke a lot of the sculpting work. So the eyes were kind of like the first thing where all these different skills would come together from modeling, from rigging, from shading and animation. The muscles on the eyes are the fastest performing muscles in their entire body. Eye rotation, the motion on that is super sensitive. The more irregularity there is, the harder it is to direct it from an animator standpoint, because now you have to manipulate every keyframe or every frame to make it feel like it's a natural motion. We found like stock footage of people blinking and looking around and how the eyelids react to the eyes movement. And we also just looked at each other's faces a lot, which was very uh, interesting. In Blender, there's a live animation mode. If you hit play and you have auto key on, you move stuff around, it will record your motion in real time. You stop playing and it has this bunch of keys that it created. It gives you the most accurate representation of your motion. I mostly work on the first uh, sequence of the animation during the fight when the robot and Einar are fighting and uh, Einar grabs the arm and is hitting with the wrench. That also was really complicated because it was like two characters moving and the camera also moving at the same time. So it was like a dance. I try to collect movies that are placed in a different spectrum in terms of 
robotic realism versus robotic stylization for a look at animation. One of the movies uh, that I looked at was uh, Chappie, where they use motion capture, actually humans forming in a motion capture suit. And that to me felt, for our movie, too smooth and too sophisticated. We looked at The Mandalorian, where there is this comet robot that has this very limited axis on where he can move in, but use that in a creative way to still be able to fight in a 360 degrees angle. One of the challenges that the production had was to have realistic hair, hair rendering, but also the hair groom, which would be directed to the specific look. That kind of evolved a little bit out of the necessity that we needed to do hair, of course. We tried to do photorealism, there's going to be some high fidelity hair grooming. The tools we had in Blender, they were focused on procedural hair, which is you have a guiding hair and then you in interpolate children hair. And for that, we decided to use a lot of the framework we had built for geometry nodes. In one hand, to support a fully destructive pipeline, where you literally have every single hair in your face and can go and groom, and that's just fast and interactive. At the same time, to allow to have geometry nodes to work on top of that, so you could have some randomization that you can just add, add some fuzziness. Just randomizing the length. Of course, the deformation of the hairs and also taken over by geometry nodes. Now that we had that new curve system that was also fully working for rendering in Eevee, I thought it would be nice to also just use this uh, stuff because it's also fully compatible with geometry nodes for things like shading or surfacing detail, like the stitching on the guard's name tags. I could just edit them directly and do generative procedures on top of like manual input. Pretty useful to just create these surface details. Blender has gotten different render engines over the years, like back then, 20 years ago. So uh, there was the Blender internal render, and then over the years we got cycles, of course. With Eevee, we're a little bit back into the into the scanline territory where we're trying to fake a lot of things. You need to understand the way light works a little bit more because the render engine doesn't do a lot of the things like bouncing around and accurate reflections or so. You get a lot of, lot of creativity out of that, so you can really fine tune the shot to your needs. You still have a large part of the iteration work in real time where we see a preview of what we're doing basically almost as it looks at the final frame while we're working on it in real time. And that's obviously a huge benefit for like all departments. For shading also where um, I can do texture painting on top of the actual result of the shader in real time. There are also some downsides. <laughs> the main one is probably the shader compilation, which just takes a lot of time and every time I was editing the shader I needed to recompile the whole node tree that I was working on. I was, I was putting a lot of nodes <laughs> into those shaders. A lot of the time during lighting we actually see something that's very close to the final image because we're using the Blender Filmic color transform, which already delivers a very good image and the grading is just adding a little bit of icing on top of that. We, we are able to craft the image in the lighting process and the rendering and compositing already as much as possible. So grading is only um, ironing out those little kinks where a shot might look a little bit too low contrast, the colors are a little bit muted, or the security robot has too much pink in their face in that shot and it's dragging too much attention to it. Um, like we, we are able to iron out these little kinks but uh, overall, uh, we don't do too much in the grading. Uh, one of the interesting things was the love robot. It's not necessarily a total robotic robot. It has a sort of a life form in there. And that makes it very interesting because you have to emphasize that it's a robot, but also emphasize the, the sort of human part in there. One of the harder part was making the ventilation uh, sound like breathing. So another interesting thing not, is not necessarily the uh, A sound effect, but it's the overall contrast between the super high tech or advanced security robot sounds, like they don't need any oil even, and all the DIY robots from the slum. So for the security robot, we, we made it sound super high tech and very slick. And also the gun was uh, really on point and super constant. But then we felt something was, was missing because it's also, of course, a very dangerous robot. And then we uh, started editing uh, some uh, yeah, sort of synthesizer vocalizations on it that would make it more uh, menacing. Mm. Oh, 
only three minutes late as far as it could be. We are going to start, guys. Yeah, Just act start. as if nothing is happening. Just uh, go, go. Now that the production of Charge is wrapped up, we got to enjoy a nice wrap party with a live stream where we share with the community the launch of the film and uh, a glimpse of what's going on behind the scenes. During the past year of production, the team kept sharing the work in progress on the Blender Studio platform. The production logs, they document extensively the work done with screen captures, pictures and demo files. And uh, we also keep expanding the pipeline and documentation section. This is an essential part of our work sharing the production knowledge next to the actual Blender assets. We are truly grateful that we can keep doing this work fully independently. And this is thanks to the Blender Studio subscribers. So here is the link. Enjoy the film and uh, we will be back.